After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. So thanks to the Apostle uh, John, we're going to be in heaven for the next, uh, I don't know, 35 minutes or so. Uh, Such adventures or trips to heaven, at least in the Bible, are of course quite rare. Although there are reports elsewhere of near death or out of the body experiences, For example, a chap called Paul Collett in 1982, he claimed that he was transported to heaven for five days. While he was there, he met Jesus, who was supervising the building of mansions. And on his return, Paul Collett made a series of video messages. He comments, everything God created upon the earth is in heaven. Horses, uh, cats, dogs only these are perfect for example the dogs don't bark now i don't know what you make uh, about those kinds of accounts Uh, but a dog that doesn't bark it seems to me isn't really much good as a dog is it but i do know that only three old testament prophets isaiah ezekiel and daniel had experiences of being in the presence of God in the glory of heaven. And in our New Testament, it's only one person, the Apostle Paul. Remember how he describes how he was uh, caught up uh, to the third heaven and saw things that, that no one could ever imagine too wonderful to speak? So Paul keeps quiet. But John here doesn't. He, he writes. It's difficult to pin down, though, what John actually is experiencing and how he arrived in heaven. For like most of the book of Revelation, John's language is highly imaginative. I was in the spirit, he says in verse 2. Just as if you flick back in, back in your Bibles to chapter 1 and verse 10, just as there he comments, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So in some way, John was under the control of the Spirit of, of God, taken out of space-time dimension. And all his faculties become abnormally sensitized to spiritual reality. And he hears a voice speaking to him like a trumpet. That voice, of course, belongs to the Lord Jesus, the risen death conqueror, now reigning. And this time, in chapter 4, Jesus says to John, Come up here, John, and I will show you what must take place after this. So you see, John is about to be told, Here's the way things really are. And here's the way things will be. And the rest of of the book, with its strange visions, is the unveiling of those events which must take place. You see, we're being told there very soon, history is not random. It's under heavenly, divine management. But we're not required here, I think, to imagine that John is transported by some heavenly tractor beam when Jesus says to him, come up here. Nor are we required to believe that there is a literal door into a world where there is an actual throne surrounded by 24 other thrones on which sit men dressed in white with six winged hybrid creatures hovering nearby. No, the the language of the book of Revelation is, as we are aware, unusual. And it deals mainly in symbols and numbers and pictures. And of course, many people have come up with some very unusual, pretty weird interpretations of, uh, of all of that as a result. Listen up. The thing about the Bible is that if you are not very careful... You can read anything into the Bible, and you can get anything out of the Bible that you want. But having said that, just because this part of Scripture, the book of Revelation, has been misused, it doesn't mean that we should be frightened of it, or indeed that we should avoid it. Because all you need, really, 
as you work through chapter 4 of Revelation, is there a finger in some of the key Old Testament passages, like Isaiah 6 or Ezekiel 1 and Daniel 7. With a finger in those passages, we can pretty well make sense of most of what is going on here. So, if that's the what of John's experience, the why, that's more obvious. You see, John has been exiled by the Roman Empire to the island of Patmos because he's a believer in Jesus and the leader of the church. He's banned, in other words, from all Christian worship. So you see, for him, this, this day pass to heaven is, is wonderfully reassuring. He can put his personal suffering and isolation into perspective. For this is what is really true. And uh, this is who he truly is. And that's also helpful for the seven church communities to which the Lord Jesus has written, you remember, in the first few chapters. Here are Christian gatherings facing enormous pressure. Things are in a bit of a mess. There's external persecution, there's internal division and compromise. And doubtless they're asking, why is Christ's church so unimpressive, so, uh, so defeated? What, what's gone wrong with us? Are things out of control? And that's how chapter 3 ends, with a, a door closed. And outside of that door, Jesus is standing. But notice as chapter 4 begins, there's a door into heaven. Not a door on earth, but a door into heaven. And this door is open. Come up here, John. Have a look at what's going on. Now, now, what do you see? So what does he see? Well, I'm really grateful to my two-year-old granddaughter, Karis, for helping me sort all of this out. You see, she was in a travel cot uh, uh, in our bedroom on, on Friday night, and she woke up at about 3 o'clock in the morning. She climbed into bed with uh, Hop, the rabbit, and Ah-U, the monkey. That's U-A, back to front, as you probably realize. So we had Hop, the rabbit, and Ah-U, the monkey, in bed with us, but she would not sleep. I ended up making monkey and rabbit noises until eventually she settled back down. But that left me wide awake. My mind was full of this, this passage with its peculiar living beings. And th then I saw it. The structure of the sermon this morning fell nicely into place. So if you get anything from the message this morning, go and thank Karis. So what was it that I saw at 4 o'clock on Friday morning? Well, what does John see? Firstly, the indescribable glory of God. Do you notice how John is searching all the time here for the right words to describe what he sees? The phrase in verse 2, there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian. Jasper and carnelian. I tell you, apart from Sean's engagement ring, the nearest I've been to such magnificent precious stones is the jewelry channel, the shopping channel on TV. I, I, I find it, I don't know about you, I find it to be a great cure for insomnia. Unless, of course, Karis has a sleepover with us, in which case it's rabbit and monkey noises. Anyway, Channel 49 on Freeview, Rocks and Co. Have you been there? An auction of uh, giant rubies and emeralds and sapphires, the latest and biggest flawless Iliana 18-carat diamond ring. Starting price, £6,999. Yet, within a few seconds, there's, there's a buzzer, and the price drops to 9 99 and a stock warning, only a few left, and somebody from Barnsley rings up to take the last one at now 2 .99. It doesn't take long to realize that there's a con going on here or something not quite right. 
But look, look, no one's conning anyone in heaven. God's flawless character is like the most brilliant jewel glistening in the light. He outshines the sun in beauty and glory, which is why John quickly runs out of categories and his word power fails him. For the God of the Bible is beyond language. If we imagine that we can ever fully comprehend God, then we clearly haven't encountered him. If we think that we have got God taped, then we need to think again. That was John's experience, trying to describe the, the indescribable. Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophet, uh, had a very similar experience to John. Here's how Ezekiel puts it in the first chapter of his prophecy. Like, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. There it is again, that familiar reality, language failing. For how do you describe a God who is hotter than the, the hottest furnace, more powerful than a million nuclear reactors, purer than the driven snow, more magnificent than the most stunning sunset? You see, where reason and image and symbol and language fail, faith adores. The indescribable glory of God. That's the first thing I saw at four o'clock on Friday morning. The second thing, the unrivaled supremacy of God. Of all that John struggles to make sense of, there is one thing that is absolutely clear to him as he looks through that open door. Before me, he says, before me was a throne in heaven. And what we've got here is the command and control center, which is at the very at the very heart of the universe. And there's no power struggle going on here among the armies of heaven, no crisis management of some emergency committee being called to deal with an unexpected disaster. No, God reigns in unrivaled supremacy. He, he sits, notice this John, he sits on a permanent throne, not on some portable chair. It's said that in some countries in South America and the Middle East and Africa, if you can knock off the palace, you can rule the country. All you've, all you've got in some of those situations, of course, is a palace ringed by, by guys holding machine guns with, uh, with bands of bullets over their chest. And it's that simple. If you can come in with your gang and mow them down and take over the throne, you can be the king. Heaven is not like that. Not like that at all. There's, there's no coup about to happen here. God reigns immovably. And that is very important because as the visions of the book of Revelation unfold, and you may be familiar with them, the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls and the beast out of the sea and another beast from the land, Somebody might think in all of that that God has lost control or that somebody has knocked off the, the heavenly temple and stolen the throne. Wasn't that Isaiah's problem in the Old Testament? Everything in the nation of Israel was going to pieces. The great king Uzziah, who had been king for 52 years, was dead. And so Isaiah rushes to the temple to check in with God and see if somebody has taken over the throne. And what's Isaiah's experience? I saw the Lord high and lifted up. You see, when our health goes and friends disappoint us, when all our securities are shaken and our props are taken from us, 
That's the vision we need. The vision through the open door. Come up here. Where God is seated on the throne. Bring, bring your worries and fears, your pressures and problems, and see them all in the light of what is true there and always true, the unrivaled supremacy of God. The third thing is the unapproachable majesty of God. The unapproachable majesty of God. If you happen to call by chance in on me at home in Surrey Road as I was, I don't know, mowing the lawn or pottering around in my garden shed, although that's very unlikely, by the way. But let's just say I'm, I'm in the garden somewhere and you knock on the door. It's reasonable to assume that, that if you ring the doorbell, I, I'd open it and invite you into the house and maybe, maybe even give you a drink. But you try that at Buckingham Palace and see what happens. If you knocked on the door there, if there is a door at Buckingham Palace, well, first you've got to get past those uh, great big soldiers at the big perimeter gates. Uh, and, and then if you manage that, you might have to persuade Her Majesty's security guards to let you through. And then there's the members of the royal household to deal with. And of course, you've got to take on the corgis. You don't just turn up at Buckingham Palace unannounced, do you? You can do that with me in Surrey Road, but not with the Queen. You see, the more glorious, the more majestic, the more powerful you are, the more you are separated from others. So when we think about the God of the universe, how much more unlikely is it that you, we can get access to him? That's what's going on in verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, the unapproachable majesty of God. I think John has Mount Sinai on his mind, don't you think that? As he describes the thunder and lightning where God gave the law to Israel amidst the noise of, of lightning flashes and thunderclaps forbidding anyone to dare climb the mountain of God. The people were to keep away for their own good because God's moral purity and holiness would otherwise incinerate them. And verse 6 of our passage reinforces this idea of distance also comments John before the throne there was what looked like a, a, a sea of glass clear as crystal it's as if John sees the, 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 the floor before the throne of God in heaven stretching out ahead of him for mile after mile like a shimmering ocean way into the distance but John sees something else. For although this God dwells in unapproachable and majestic light, read verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Cornelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. What's the fourth thing I saw on Friday morning very early? the incredible mercy of God. Now, I don't think there are any prizes for guessing where this image of a rainbow comes from into John's mind. Noah's Ark and the universal flood and God's promise written in the multicolored sky to every succeeding generation. I will not flood the world, the earth again. So do you see what we have here? There are two realities being held together. On the one hand is God's distance, his unapproachable majesty and holiness. And on the other, God's nearness, 
and mercy and forgiveness symbolized in that rainbow of hope. That incredible mercy that surrounds God's unapproachable majesty. And all that follows from that throne in the book of Revelation over the next umpteen chapters, the thunder and lightning of judgments, all of that is covered by God's rainbow of promise. Do you see that? And because that is true, the final angle on this chapter comes into focus there in verse 4. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white. They had crowns of gold on their heads. What have we got here? We have the universal worship of God. Because that rainbow encircles the throne, it makes possible the 24 elders near the throne worshiping God. Now, I take the 24 to be a symbol of the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New. Together, 12 and 12, they represent the whole people of God, the church in every age. And they're dressed in white, and they sit in triumph on their thrones because they are victorious and have overcome. But in the center of the throne, move your eyes down to the middle of verse 6, we meet another group of worshipers. These are the living creatures with eyes everywhere, back and front, and six wings to cover eyes and feet, and two wings to fly at God's command. And there are four of them. The lion, the noblest of the animals, the ox, the strongest, man, the face of a man, the wisest, and the eagle, the swiftest in creation, representing perhaps the four corners of the earth, the whole of the animal creation. And so what have you got? You've got on the one hand the 24 elders, the whole church, and then you've got the living creatures, the whole of creation, and what are they doing? They are responding to the majesty, glory, and beauty, and supremacy of the king on the throne of the universe. And they fall before the God who reigns in power and who draws near in mercy. And they call out to this glorious God as we hear them and see them in verse 6. Day, verse 8, day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So that, my friends, is what John saw through the open door of heaven. But what can we learn from it? Well, let me start where I just finished, with worship. For I think we can learn, firstly, some very important things about the nature of worship. Worship, you see, never, never, ever begins with us. And it's never really about us. God is at the center of worship. He's the focus, the God who is utterly good and utterly powerful. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now that's a combination that you don't find on earth. The all-powerful on earth, the all-powerful in this world are nearly always corrupt. But God is all good and all-powerful. There isn't anything that is doable that he can't do, and there isn't anything that he wills to do that that he can't do. And having done it, he's never tired. He is never weary. That isn't true of us, is it? We can conceive of things to do, and, and we can't do them, plenty of them. But God has infinite power. And whatever he does, he does for the right reasons. He is light, and there's no darkness in him at all. He is perfectly good and true and pure 
And notice, he is like this forever and ever, who was and is and is to come. He's the eternal, all-powerful, utterly good God. He reigns forever. There are three kinds of beings, those who had a beginning and will have an end. They're called animals. And there are beings who have a beginning but will never have an end. That's angels and people. And there is one being who has no beginning and no end. And that is God. The great I am, the eternal king. And because God is that kind of God, he is worthy of our wholehearted worship. Do you see how this is drawn out of the images in this passage? The living creatures, observe John, never stop saying, holy, holy, holy. The elders, what do they do? They give glory and thanks to God, and then they fall down, John observes, and they cast their crowns before the throne of God. And then, going on all the time, is this symphony of sound a music first from the quartet of living creatures and then from the 24 elders who join the quartet. And when we get into chapter 5, which is very much a linked chapter in this book of Revelation, the living creatures, well, they've picked up harps and are playing harps. And there are thousands, says John, thousands upon thousands of angels singing in a loud voice until finally at the end of the fifth chapter, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea is rocking the cosmos. Now, I don't have time to to drive this home. But that is what we are aiming at in worship. And by worship, we we mean, of course, not just what we do in our congregational gatherings on Sundays. What we mean by worship is what we offer to God tomorrow and the rest of the week. This wholehearted response to God with our mind and body and soul and strength. This wholehearted response to God in the whole of life, across the whole of creation. That's worship, which means, does it not, which means that the doctor in the surgery, the scientist in the laboratory, the artist in the studio, and the parent in the kitchen can each join in a great song of praise to the God whose glory fills the earth. So something then about the nature of worship. Secondly, to take away with us, something about the future of the church. You see, does the church have a future? That that was the question that John and others must have been asking. John in exile, as he delivered the, the letters of Jesus to those seven churches, Where is all this going to end, Jesus? The problems and issues and the infighting and the persecution. Well, 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 says Jesus, come up here, John. Take a look at the 24 elders with their crowns and white clothes and their thrones of glory. Look, John, there's the church. The people of God triumph. And listen to their songs, John. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they have their being and were created. John, John will will not let his first century readers forget that above Caesar's throne, there is one throne to rule them all, a higher throne. And from this throne, the wheeling planets receive their orders. And to this throne, the gigantic galaxies give their allegiance. And before this throne, every living thing falls down in worship. And through this throne, everything has its place. And nothing exists without it. 
does the church then have a future? That, that must be a question asked by a lot of Christians today around the world. Those 70 believers who were killed in Lahore last weekend as they celebrated Easter. Just one more story of persecution and discrimination in the global war against the church. It's reckoned that 100,000 Christians have been killed every year for the past decade. Do you know that works out at 11 Christians somewhere in the world every hour, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, martyred simply because they follow Christ and are prepared to say with the worship of heaven, you are worthy, our Lord and God. They die because they are prepared to stand up and say, Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar, not Mugabe, not Mohammed, not Kim Jong-un. Now, folks, that kind of suffering may not be what we're facing here in work or in society or at home. But when we find ourselves weary and rejected because of our faith or embarrassed because of our faith and uncomfortable, we, we, we must ask not, is it worth it? But is he worth it? Is Jesus worth it? Well, here's the last thing to take home with you, the uniqueness of Christ. Although, of course, there's a lot to see in heaven through that open door. The focus of chapter 4 is the throne of God, and the focus of chapter 5 is the Lamb of God. Listen to this from verse 6 of chapter 5. Then I saw a lamb, says John, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. A lamb once dead now alive forevermore. Friends, that's why the 24 elders are victoriously around the throne of God, because of Jesus the Lamb. That's why there's a rainbow of mercy circling the throne of God, because of Jesus the Lamb. You know the lines of the old hymn, near, so very near to God. Nearer I could not be, for in the presence of his Son, I am as near as he. Dear, so very dear to God. Dearer I could not be, for in the presence of his Son, I am as dear as he. You see, that's why the, the scrolls of history in chapter 5 can be unraveled. For Jesus alone has the authority to take the scrolls and open them. And therefore, the people of God, the saints of God, need not fear. And that's why heaven sings a new song in chapter 5, verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then, that's why heaven cries in a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and glory and strength. By his death and resurrection, the Lamb wins. And because the Lamb wins, the church wins. Because the Lamb wins when the saints are called up yonder. We'll be there. Because the Lamb wins. History is not random, but divinely shaped and managed. Because the Lamb wins, we can come through the open door into the worship of heaven with our worries and fears and anxieties and lay them all before the Lamb, the victorious, risen Lamb. Let's pray. And as I pray, I want to invite the servers 
to come up to the front and uh, the bands to take their place here on the platform. We're going to come to a time of communion now. That's very appropriate. Let's pray. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the risen and reigning King. Thank you that we can be part of the the glory of heaven's worship. Thank you that we can come through the open door and put our lives into their perspective and see reality the way it truly is. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for us. And as we celebrate that right now together as a Christian family, may we rejoice that the Lamb has won, that the Lamb stands in the center of the throne and that Jesus is Lord. May he be Lord of our lives this week, we pray. May all of our life be worship to our great creator God whose glory fills the earth. And may we surrender everything to our Lord Jesus, lay our crown before him as we anticipate that great and glorious day when we will be with the saints in glory forever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen.